welcome everybody. This is the first learning and sharing webinar that we're running through Egging. Yeah, it would be great to hear who's here and where you work or what organisations you're involved with. So would everyone be happy to type that into the chat? Just so we've got a bit of a, a record of who's here. And you can just introduce yourself in the chat as we go. And just to give you a, a quick idea of how this will go today, we're aiming, we've got our keynote speaker, Katie Beverly here from the Circular Economy Innovation Communities. And we're also going to hear two other presentations. We've got Janine and Becky, who are both peer mentors with Egin and do a lot of work with the circular economy as well. After that, as we do have quite a few of us, we'll do another quick, well, maybe 10 to 15 minutes um, in breakout rooms again. So you get a chance to talk about these topics in a bit more detail. And if you want, you'll get the chance to kind of talk with one of the speakers in a little bit more detail as well, before we all come back together for some maybe final questions or thoughts. Um, yeah, all right, shall we? I'll just hand to Katie to get started, if that's all right. That's fine by me. I'll just share my screen. Can you let me know if it's showing properly? We did test this beforehand, but I'm always a bit wary. So can you see my screen? Yes. OK, great. So hello, everybody. And I'm really pleased to be here to talk to you today. Um, so I am talking to you from a project which is just coming to an end now, a European social funded project on circular economy innovation communities. Um, and the kind of the title of the talk was really what's a circular economy and what could it look like on the ground in Wales? But actually, I am going to address that, but it's probably going to be a little bit of a kind of romp around what cake actually is. So cake is what we tend to call ourselves. We don't go through the whole circular economy innovation communities every time we just so we are cake, basically, um, which is usually a problem because a lot of people join us because they think it's real cake. So we expect we get a lot of people who complain quite a lot about the catering sometimes. Um, so starting with a kind of conversation about what is the circular economy? Um, well, I, I was really dreading this question coming up um, and we had a little bit of a chat in our breakout room about what it was. Um, and I know from experience and certainly from our first session in circular economy in circular economy innovation communities that you ask 100 people what the circular economy is and you're quite likely to get 100 different answers. Um, and we often see it kind of as a, a setting opposition to what we call the linear economy, which is our traditional economy of taking stuff, making stuff from it, using, disposing and polluting. And when we see people talking about the circular economy, we often see them then saying, OK, so this is about using, maintaining, recycling and so on. But that only covers a tiny proportion of the circular economy. So the circular economy is that's really what we call the technical cycle of the circular economy. There's a lot around restoration of land. There's a lot around um, making healthy ecosystems. There's a lot around building industrial symbiosis processes where people can work together with each other's materials. So there's a huge range of things that the circular economy can cover. Um, and, it, and purists will say, you know, oh, it's got to be about circulating materials and keeping them going around in loops. But then if it's only about that, that put, cuts out aspects of the sharing economy, such as things like Ben Thig, the Library of Things. So it's not a useful or helpful definition. And actually, increasingly in cake, we're thinking defining the circular economy is actually a bit of an exercise in futility because it's it's very, very context based it really matters what it is that you're trying to do with it so one of the things that i think is a challenge at the moment is that we live in this kind of world where we're talking about net zero we're talking about circular economy we're talking about sustainability and all of those things kind of mean different things to different people and everybody contests it so it all gets massively confusing so welsh government have been really helpful by producing a very, very simple definition of the circular economy. So, and their aim is to keep resources in use for as long as possible and to avoid waste. So that is how they define the circular economy. And they also say that it's really a cornerstone of a prosperous and resilient world. So when you're thinking about the language of the well-being of future generations, it's about thinking about what does it mean to be a resilient world? What does it mean to be a prosperous world? What does it mean to have low carbon industry? 
And so it's all coupled to that wider policy goal in, in kind of Welsh government's language of the well of the well-being of future generations. Now we were slightly uncomfortable with this definition in cake. As I say, everybody's got a definition and everybody picks holes in everybody else's definition. So I was slightly uncomfortable because to me, the thing that the circular economy is, is a value creation process. You have to, some, you're not taking waste and just turning it into something else to not get any value, basically. You're looking to create value. And it's also not just about using, you know, it, it, just because something's circular doesn't necessarily mean that it will be effective and it will create effective value. So we really were kind of toying with these words. In fact, we were talking earlier in our breakout room about the idea of cradle to cradle. And actually, one of the things that cradle to cradle emphasizes is the idea that we move away from resource efficiency towards resource effectiveness. And I've always kind of held that as being at the heart of what the circular economy should be doing. We should be effective with our use of resources. And that means using as little as we possibly can to create as much value as we possibly can. And then having kind of like a range of things in between. So, so that's where we start. We don't call it a definition. We call it a framework. We basically say, this is how we consider the circular economy. It's about really creating value through the effective use of resources. And then what we do is we talk to the organisations that we work with to ask them what they think the circular economy is. And as I said, you tend to get at least talk to everybody and you'll get 100 different definitions. But what we also notice, so these are word clouds that we, we create on our first day of the CAKE programme to get people to talk to us about what really matters to them. And what we notice is that the context in which they work, the things that they are trying to do, so the things that are their day-to-day -day business, and the their long-term vision of what a circular economy should deliver for Wales tends to shape this. So what we see is that if we give people a framework to talk about the circular economy, they'll tell us how it's going to make their, their world different, and that's what we do rather than try and even define it. So asking what is the circular economy to me is always a bit of a difficult one because I go, well, it's what it means to you, really. Um, so, so, yeah, and I stand by it. I, I still do that all the time. So, so what I want to talk about, though, is the idea that the circular economy exists on multiple levels. So we have what I would say is micro level. The micro level is how an individual business will become circular. You know, so how it will work with its supply chain, how it will do things individually to develop a circular process and to become more, create more value through the use of the resources within the business. But then there's a meso level, which is where multiple businesses might work together and they might come and, you know, so they might be in the same location, they might be in the same sector, they might do, but there'll be kind of almost like a sectoral approach or a community might work together to develop a circular, to develop circular services for themselves. But what CAKE itself is concerned with is much more the macro level, which is about how a region becomes circular. So it's not about the individual actions of individual companies. It's about how the whole region and the activities that happen within that region become circular. And we're particularly interested in what the public sector does within that. So when you talk to, to Andy Rees, who's the kind of head of um, resource efficiency in Welsh Government, he often says really clearly, we don't want a circular economy, we want an economy that's circular. And that means we want to be able to do the same sorts of things as we're currently doing, but do them in a circular way. So that almost changes some of the conversations that we have about circularity. Um, so if you're really interested in the micro level, which is how it's happening on the ground in businesses, we've got lots of resources and lots of case studies on our website um, of businesses that are doing this. So I'll, um, I've, I've got a link to that at the end of the presentation. But we're much more interested in the, in the public sector and the third sector as engines for change. So when I say that, what I mean is that the public sector spends a lot of money. It directs a lot of policy. And it's basically a leader, you know, so if you see the public sector doing something interesting, 
um, and doing something circular, there's a chance for people to come along and get involved in that. There's also a chance of that spillover. So they work with businesses. So you can get a lot of circular things happening because they're asking because the public sector is asking their supply chain to come and join in. So the public sector and the third sector who deliver public services with them are really important. But the, the heart of this is that that's being circular is not their key role. Their key role is to deliver good public services. So going back to that definition, that, I, that conversation that Andy often has, what we need to be able to do is to think about how you can deliver public services that create value through the effective use of resources. So we don't want public services. We don't want circular public services. We want public services that are circular. So that is what CAKE really started out to do. These are just a snapshot of some of the organizations we've worked with. So we've worked with a lot of housing associations. We've worked with um, people from the Welsh government. We've worked with a lot of um, third sector organizations such as such as the Repair Cafe and Benthic and um, a lot of the health boards, um, quite a few charities, a lot of education, a lot of local authorities. So it's a it's a big number of people, it's a big kind of spread of people we've worked with. And we've worked with um I think a I think my count, Gary has 180, my count is 179 individuals on this. Um, so there's 179 people that have been through the whole of the CAKE process. And the idea is that what we aim to do is build capacity to think about how you become more circular in public services. Um, and to build communities of practice that connect together people who are trying to achieve the same sort of thing. So we're really about enabling people to undertake circular innovation. Because the other thing about circularity is that it's not often we think about resource efficiency as being an end of pipe solution where we saw where we create a problem through the linear economy and we solve it through something that we do that makes it circular. Actually, we shouldn't see the circular economy that way. We should see it as a massive innovation opportunity, a massive way of rethinking how we do business, saving ourselves money, creating better services, doing things much, much more effectively. And that's the way that we should think about it, not about a way of sorting out, of solving the problems we've created, but a way of making sure they don't happen in the first place. So obviously there's a transition that we go through there to make sure to, to change the process. And that's what we're really interested in. So what it basically looks like on the ground is it's a 10 month program. Um, we are open and free, or we were open and free, we're now coming to an end, but we were open and free to anybody from the public sector and anybody from um, the third sector. And we took them through a design thinking process because design thinking is really, it's, it's a process of experiential kind of experimenting with things. It de-risks innovation, particularly in the public sector. So it forms a bridge between public sector often mistake uncertainty for risk um, so they'll kind of go that's a bit uncertain so therefore it's a risk but that's actually not true uncertainty and risk are two very separate things and so through our process of kind of iterative development involving stakeholders right from the very beginning through prototyping starting small doing little things we de-risk the uncertainty so people can kind of say actually we're pretty certain this is going to work now because we've gone through this design thinking process. And we do that with groups of people who work around challenges that are collaborative so that everybody agrees what kind of a challenge they want to work on at the beginning. We try and get as many participants into one of those groups and then we take them through this 10 month process to kind of solve that problem. We're not, I say we're not experts in the circular economy. My background's in the circular economy. So I, <laughs> so I guess to some extent, I do know a bit about it, but we aren't there to provide expertise. What we're there is to facilitate people who can come in that have the context that people want to talk about. So guest speakers who are relevant to our cohorts, going on visits to sites where people might kind of, might be really relevant to the organizations, picking examples out um, of things that are happening already that could inspire people and so on. So, so we don't deliver 
so this is how you should do the circular economy. We facilitate people to find out what the circular economy, how they could do the circular economy. And this is a bit what it looks like, I guess. So it's very hands on. There's lots of kind of lots of things where we get people to test their assumptions. So we through activities and games and experiential learning things. And that's all kind of surrounded by this design thinking process. So every time we introduce a new thing, we'll have an experiential learning activity that encourages people to think in the way that they need to. Um, so if they need to think about the assumptions that they're making, we'll have an assumptions kind of, we'll have an experiential activity that tests people what assumptions people are making. If we're thinking about prototyping, we'll have something where they have to kind of iterate and develop a process through and through. Um, we've got a whole set of thing, tools and things like Miro boards. We break it up into each step of the design thinking process. We give examples, we get people to talk and all of this sort of stuff. And everybody works together in a group. And the idea is that by the end of the whole of the process, we will have public sector people who are sharing an innovation process and are sharing a passion for doing this. So actually they, that will then roll on. And every time there is a new innovation, every time there's a new project, they will apply this methodology to make sure that we have public services that are circular. So that's basically the principle. So we've done a little bit of analysis on the people who've gone through our program. Um, even though we start out not to deliver circular economy knowledge, it appears that we do through all of these activities. So most people feel that they had, they had developed knowledge, not about what the circular economy is, but about how to action it. You know, so that's the important thing. It's not necessary. We don't necessarily need to get bogged down in definitions. We need to know what we need to do. And that's where CAKE is kind of aiming at what we need to do. So we got 90% of people thinking that we're going to be working in that area, but 75% thinking that the innovation skills, so the innovation skills are all have circular elements. So they get you to think about the questions that you might think about when you're looking at implementing circular solutions. 69% of participants want to continue working in their community of practice. It's a little bit low. And the reason for that is that there is a consensus building around the challenge. So often people come in, not necessarily wanting to work on that particular challenge, but wanting to go through the process. So when they leave, they might not carry on with their challenge group, but they might then start to see the bigger group of people and actually start to form other communities of practice. The one place where we're not doing great is that it still feels a little bit like our cake participants are still a little bit like lone wolves. 50% of people didn't think their organization's engagement with the circular economy had, had increased through what we were doing. Um, just purely because it's quite, because it's about focusing on regional work and getting people together in the region. And we're not necessarily recruiting we're often recruiting people who are passionate about this, but aren't necessarily, don't necessarily have the agency to change things within their organization. So that's something to work for us to work on when we come to the next iteration. What will we actually do to make, get that figure up? Um, and the funding itself that we got for this had nothing at all to do with the circular economy. It was us that put that badge on it. Um, it was all about regional working and open innovation and getting people to work together. But to be honest, the circular economy works on collaboration. There is no way you can go to an economy that's circular if you're not encouraging collaboration and if you're not being effective in terms of developing solutions that can meet the needs of kind of multiple organisations. You're not really going to get there very quickly. So we found that a lot of our participants still wanted to do open innovation and regional working. So we think it's a good sign. But as I mentioned before, they, the Welsh Government really see the circular economy as delivering on prosperity and resilience. We wanted to look, because public services do a lot more than that. So what we really wanted to look at was what if we were talking about having public services that were circular, what are they actually delivering in the wellbeing of future generations? 
And it turns out that as a gem, if you create these circular, if you create these public services that are circular, they deliver a lot more value. They deliver a lot more forms of value than actually just this prosperity and resilience. They deliver against health and well-being. They deliver against community cohesion. They deliver against biodiversity. They deliver against um, cultural aspects of the circular economy and they deliver globally as well because we're being if we can get Wales to be a region that actually does what it says in its policy and becomes a one planet region then we're delivering massive amounts of global value because we're just using our proportion of resources so these are our challenge groups I'm counting quickly in my head as to how many we actually had 16 17 18 19 22 25 27 groups 27 groups doing things all the way from engaging tenants right through to community growing projects, through to organising festivals, looking at sustainable power, developing circular health and developing circular health services, uh, using procurement, all of these aspects, and they deliver wide ranging to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So I guess that's the end of my presentation, really. I just want to say thank you for listening to it and remind you that if you're more interested in what it, what, well, what businesses and organisations on a micro level within Wales could be doing, we've got a, a whole set of case studies on our website. So pop onto our website, go and have a look, and you can see what businesses are actually doing in Wales to become more circular. Thank you, Katie. Great. And so there'll be a bit of um, opportunity to ask more questions to Katie in a little bit. But first, we're going to hear from our other two speakers. So we've got two um, egg-in peer mentors who are going to share a little bit about their on-the-ground experience of working with the circular economy. And I mean, I don't know which one of you'd like to go first. It's up to you. Um, Janine, do you want to go first? Okay, so we've got Janine Cusworth, who's the founder and director of Resource. Janine, do you want to tell us a bit more? Hi, thank you. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm the founder and director of a social and environmental enterprise called Resource. So, so pretty much all of our activity is around the circular economy, um, and we use that as a tool uh, for community engagement. I'm going to share um, a short video because it shows the different types of projects and activities that we're in. But I am, I've, as has been requested of me, I'm going to talk a little bit more about our Bus Benthic project. Um, that's one that's sort of at the fore at the moment and um, talk about it in terms of set, setting up that as a circular economy initiative and, and sort of the challenges and uh, opportunities that created. So I'll share the video first. And, the last time I played it, I couldn't get the sound to work, but it has got um, subtitles. So bear with me if the sound doesn't work. I, I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> ah, right. Can everybody can see the screen? I'm gathering. Yeah. My name is Janine Cusworth, and I'm the founder and lead of a social and environmental enterprise called Resource. We're a community interest company based in North Wales. We work within the circular economy, but also with a focus on creating opportunities for adult citizens from the labour market. We have a number of initiatives and one of our newest is our reuse store based in the centre of Rhythm. It's a scrap store where we collect items from local businesses and trade and household, and we resell them to the community for low cost creative activities. So based at our site at Kaidai in Denby, we have a remakery, which is where we repurpose wood and also upcycle items with our volunteers, preventing waste from going to landfill. We have a community replastics processing project where we take items that aren't usually or easily recycled by our local authorities. When we take these, we shred them down and we can reform them into other useful objects such as plant pots and clock faces. 
with this project, we are hoping to scale to include more people who are marginalised from the labour market with this activity. So the Borough Bus is a community sharing project that travels around four towns of North East Wales, where people for low costs can borrow or hire items from the vehicle, it includes items such as household tools, gardening tools, and exciting things like popcorn machines. We hope that this project prevents items from going to landfill, promotes sharing within the community, and also contributes to a circular economy. So Resource is really excited to be able to support our community in taking part in circular economy activities. We are always interested in how we can effectively stop items going to landfill. Okay, thank you. So hopefully that just gives sort of we're as you can see, we're a very tangible um organization and now we have a focus on um, the inclusion of people that are marginalized from the labor market. So we work quite intensely with people with disabilities and mental health needs, autism, and so on. About 95 percent about 90% of our workforce um, has a, a long-term health condition or, or disability. Um, but although we have a focus on, on inclusion, uh, what we say is we're not sort of disability specific. We like to think that we create a sort of micro um, communities where different members of the community come together. It doesn't matter what their skills or interests are, we can utilize whatever strengths and skills they want to use, um, you know, to, to create sort of an end product or an end, an end goal. I think where we see we fit is that sometimes kind of the language and the rhetoric around a sort of climate is um, very difficult for people. Um, and also locally, um, you know, there is some really active groups but it tends to be sort of the same people sort of going around the same, the same sort of groups. And so, you know, we really like to try and think that we, we meet people where they're at and what their understanding is of, of things. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about the um, bus benthic as, as a focus, really because um, like Katie was saying, this project, um, is, the, the funding's coming to an end, but we're hoping it's going to continue because um, it's been a huge project to, to set up. So. Um, and also it's a demonstration of not just, you know, a single business or community, it's actually a number of towns that have come together to, to create this opportunity and this collaboration, which really fits well with where we live in, in rural North Wales. So um, we decided on a mobile um, library of things in effect because um, we're very rural, we have, um, you know, we're small towns with geographical areas that, are, you know, a green space. Um, and so static models potentially wouldn't get the footfall or be as accessible. So uh, it's a collaboration between, as I say, four towns in North East Wales. Um, there's a steering committee of around 20 people who we meet, we've been meeting for around two years to develop the project. Um, so it's a really broad steering uh, committee. So it's the community leaders. Um, we've got a town council, a couple of town council members on there. Um, so the county councils are now sort of coming on board. So we've been sort of chipping away at sort of creating these uh, collaborations as well, um, which is, you know, it has, is now working. So it's, it's, it's great to see. Um, so we, um, we modelled the project off a similar one, um, which is in Totnes called Share Shed. And um, that's the only sort of fully mobile library things we know of. So we like to think that we're second and the first in Wales. Um, and so th the challenge was around um, bringing the communities together, um, ensuring that we're meeting those individual community needs. Uh, some of the challenges are around it's quite an innovative project. Um, so things around community confidence, so getting people involved has been a real challenge. Um, we know from research, it's quite interesting that it takes people three visits to the bus before they actually then sign up as a member. So we find that quite interesting. So it feels like it's been a long haul to, um, you know, sort of build the momentum because in effect, although it is a borrowing project, it is also um, you know, creating a behaviour change around 
you know, instead of just borrowing some, you know, using some, buying something or ordering something off, off Amazon as somebody was, you know, saying actually it's kind of like planning ahead and thinking about it and actually can we get that item we need in a more sustainable, in a more sustainable manner. So um, uh, another challenge really is, as with all these sorts of projects, there's a financial self-sustaining, you know, sort of of, of, of the um, model. And um, we feel okay with that because a lot of the benthics and, and the uh, libraries of things that we know, you know, sort of in Wales and across, across the rest of the UK, um, you know, that, that's a challenge, that's a challenge for, for everybody. Um, and another challenge, it's a question that comes up time and time again, and gets a little bit frustrating, but we also have questions around safety. So what happens if, you know, so we, we lend items that are um, quite usual items that someone can go and buy from, you know, being q um, we don't have sort of a chainsaw and those sorts of things, but we have, we work with Benthig, so we have quite clear sort of waivers and, and, and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so, yeah, well, so the challenge is the self-sustaining model and continuing it and continuing it for the future. We are bringing now some volunteers on board, which is great because they meet the bus in the town in which they live. Um, on the bus itself, we have people it generates a lot of discussion around um repairing items as well so quite often the guys in the bus will get asked if they repair things but no they don't and they can then refer to the local repair cafes so we really sort of promote promote that um we accept donations of items so i think we, the project's only been running for about 10 months we've had around 100 different items donated to the project we also have people that um, lend their item to the project. So for example, we seem to be getting uh, quite a lot of suitcases because I think they're bulky and taking up people's space in their houses and, and maybe something that they use once a year, if that. So um, they're on the bus, but then the can, people can take them back, you know, w when they want to. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Obviously there might be questions at the end, but um, yeah. I'm happy for any questions or any other thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Fantastic. Yes. So yeah, there will be chance to ask some questions afterwards. Okay. And last but not least, we've got Becky, who's also one of our peer mentors. Becky, do you want to start? Hi, thank you. Yeah, so I'm just going to hopefully share my slides. Um, if I can find the right buttons. They always start hiding the minute that you've got to actually do it, don't they? So there we go. Hopefully you can all see the slides. So yeah, thank you. And it was really great to hear from Katie and Janine as well, and just, you know, finding out what's going on elsewhere. Um, and just, I'd already put this quote into the opening one. So just before I get into a little bit of background, it was really great to hear um, Katie speak and just that idea that um, circular economy is, is more than just about recycling or reuse. It's actually some steps that go on before that. The th thinking of what happens, the designing and the producing. So um, I was really pleased to pick a quote that reflected something that I didn't know somebody was going to say. So it always feels good at the beginning. Um, so yeah, so I'm Becky and um, I'm going to talk today, just give you a little bit of an insight into um, my time at Green String Flooring. And I was there from about 2009-ish um, until latter part of last year. So it was a, a huge chunk of time through lots of different um, developments as the organisation. And initially I came on board as a project development worker when it was first set up. So really getting into that, those startup challenges into something that was quite unique and quite different um, and probably still is sort of in, in this space. Um, I worked across all parts of the organisation, so feel free to ask me lots of questions about flooring. Um, I might not be able to give a great answer, but I'll definitely be able to point you in a direction of who might. So, um, And still do that thing where you're in like airports or bars or offices, we go, I recognise that carpet tile, so I don't think that will ever leave me. Um, and just and then moved into became a director in sort of 2014 and really moved into the space of looking at how we market those operations, how we support people within the 
decarbonisation, um, how we measure and report on our environmental impact, and also the governance and making sure that when we sit around that table and run an organisation, that we're given equal measure and equal voice to the environment and nature, along with our other stakeholders and people and think about social impact and the financial sustainability of the business. So you can see, I'm just going to cover in hopefully 10 minutes, um, just a little bit of the background of the organisation, um, some of the challenges that we faced and some of the impact. So just to give you um, a mini background to Queen Stream Forum, we're a community interest company limited by shares, which is an unusual form of community interest company. Um, there's not a huge number of those around. And that was really chosen at the time to um, build corporate interest and investment. Um, so there was always working in the space of what is a commercial product, a carpet tile, um, was really looking at how could we bring corporate into that area with us and get private sector support. The mission was to maximise community benefit from the reuse and sales of flooring. Um, and we focused on diverting carpet tiles from landfill. And you can see, as I've said, I came on in 2009 and was actually established in 2008. Um, based in Porth in, um, in the Rhonda with a national coverage, both in terms of where we get the material in from and um, where it goes. So going right back to the beginning, um, it's one of those kind of random ideas that comes when you're having a conversation with somebody. Um, and it was founded by Ellen Petz, which I'm sure lots of you in um, on this call will know. And um, Mark Wilson, and they just had a really random chance meeting um, and just got talking about their sort of experiences and knowledge. Ellen was a background um, in community recycling. And uh, Mark's background was in the private sector, working with a carpet tile manufacturer, a global carpet tile manufacturer. And at the time, um, they were both looking for opportunities to build in sustainable development um, and circular economy initiatives um, that were grounded in the community with a product that was thousands and thousands of millions of carpet tiles were being thrown away. And Mark was seeing this day to day in his job where he's selling a new product all the time and asking themselves questions about what happens um, to the old product. Where is all that going? And it's estimated, um, and these are relatively recent figures. So these are pre-COVID, so probably not much has changed in space in the last few years. To be estimated 400,000 tonnes of waste carpet each year in the UK. And we think that that's probably a million to a million and a half carpet tiles each year. Um, so that's a huge number. And as of 2018, you know, that green stream had been going for 10 years by that point. Reuse um, was still only 2% of what we, we, we would be, you know, we were seeing. Um, and so in terms of a circular economy initiative, um, we were looking at a product that had been designed to be very complex, something that wasn't easy to recycle. And it really needed to go, you know, back to those steps um, that kind of Katie showed us in that in that diagram of thinking, OK, so it, it's not been built in at the design of the of the product. But what can we do before it's recycled, before that energy is used to pull it apart? Um, and reuse made a really good um, sort of choice, um, partly because the material, when it's pulled up, it's one of those items that people tend to change because their branding has changed. Um, we work quite a lot in a commercial space. so when banks merge for example they may change their their colors um, and that means all the flooring comes up all the furniture comes up and this stuff because it's designed to last has got loads of value still left in it you know sort of embedded value in there um, so it made absolute sense that we found a way where we could use that value for communities um, and bring that into a, a community organization and developing employment and training and all the things that go alongside that. Now, that process of how we actually did it was basically, I've summed it up into three stages, which really oversimplifies actually, it was never this simple. Um, which was save, sort and sell, which was we save that material from landfill. Um, we would sort it in our warehouse and then sell it on. And in reality, what that actually looked like was building some relationships with carpet tile manufacturers so that when they sell in something new, how did we take that back? Um, building in relationships with 
public sector partners, with private sector partners, um, with other community organisations, maybe particularly, you know, sort of larger charities about when, you know, where's that material going when it comes out of those buildings um, and can we take it in? And because we recognise the value of that um, and, the, and the business model, that was a, a chargeable um, gate fee. And then it would come into our warehouse. We'd then sort it. We'd grade the carpet tiles. We go, OK, what is suitable, you know, for um, going in? It looks absolutely perfect. It's good. It's new. Um, it could go back into the office it came from um, and what isn't so great and maybe might be used for temporary flooring and we priced that accordingly um, and developed a range of markets in which to sell that and then over time that sort of that selling became a bit tricky and I'll when, I'll have a look at some of the the challenges um, it was really about how to be diversify those those sales channels and what do we do with all this material because at some point there's there's more material coming in so we, we're having to move it so I've summed the challenges up into four really broad areas just to give you a bit of a taste of what they look like. Um, and this is a, a, you know, we're a community based organization. We're not a huge sort of national corporate. We're really grounded in our in our community in the Rhonda. We're working with um, local people who face lots of barriers to employment, to training. Uh, um, and so we're really trying to balance that that mission that we've got around community benefits um, within that, that space of circular economy with the innovation that it needs um, so that it's not all about recycling. It's not all about reuse. It's about how do we do that and balancing our environmental mission. So that as you um, as you can see that some of what we were doing was selling new material. Um, and that's partly because for many years we were, you know, 90 to 100 percent of our income was trading income, very little um, reliance on grants. And so to continue that sort of um, income streams, you really need to innovate in that space in terms of what other products are available to open those markets. So and then there's that, that balance all the time of I want to sell this new stuff because this is amazing and this is a foot in the door. Or to be able to challenge somebody about, you know, why are they buying new or what new product are they buying? And at the same time going, but that's not helping me divert material. That's just selling everything that I'm trying to do. So we're constantly having that balance of um, of mission or profit and purpose. Um, and again, in, in as an organisation around that, that non-profit and business mindset, we found that quite frequently, putting those circular economy sort of principles at the center about how do we design in um you know something that isn't wasteful in the beginning we would go into organizations and have a look at what they've already got um to make that a really attractive um business offer along with the need to support people to um support people with material as well recognizing that that turnover and constantly juggling with that balance um, and one of our biggest challenges in circular economy um, around flooring was in this space. I'm going to kind of take these two together of that market demand and the awareness that's needed in that market and the supply chain and the partnerships that we needed to build. So what I really mean by this is that we were selling a product that most people don't think of as being suitable for secondhand. So we're loads of people used to secondhand clothes, secondhand furniture. But when you mention flooring, um, and particularly at the beginning, um, it was something that people went, secondhand flooring, that's really weird. How is it clean? What does it look like? How can it go back down? Um, so we came up with lots and lots of barriers. So as much as people and organisations really bought into the idea of you know, the circular economy and environmental impact and sustainable development, the actual reality of putting a secondhand and carpet on the floor was a real barrier for us. So we had to build quite a lot of an awareness into what that looked like, get some really good case studies together and really demonstrate it and kind of fight, create our own demand really. Um, and that was really challenging and has continued to be challenging. And similarly in the supply chain, um, we wanted 
to work with more and more public sector bodies. Um, as that awareness grew in that space, it seemed, you know, thinking around public procurement and the needs for social value and environmental impact. Um, and there's lots of challenges as a small community organisation of getting in with those huge you know, supply chains and public procurement and all the work that goes on there. And how do you balance all of that um, and find the right people to work with? And I've summed it up with a quote down at the bottom, which is running a social enterprise, um, you know, a community group, community organisation um, is like building an aeroplane whilst flying it. You have to constantly adapt, innovate and keep your mission at the forefront. And for us, it was always about coming back to how does this fulfil our social economy principles? But it's not all hard work. There is some really good stuff that comes out of that. And just looking at the impact that the organization had over a kind of 14, 15 year period. And that was that we diverted over 750,000 carpet tiles from landfill. And so um, each carpet tile is a meter square. So it's worth looking at, I think it was like a hundred football fields or something that's the equivalent to. We've done it of how many flights to the moon that would do. Um, so it's a massive amount of carpet tiles. Not forgetting that actually on a UK level, that's only 2% of what is actually thrown away. So it feels like a huge number for a, big, for a small organisation, but it's tiny in terms of what's going on. Um, and with that material, we ran some free donation days as well. Um, and that really flagged to us the need that people have for flooring in their homes, how expensive it is. And that's only been compounded more with COVID and the cost of living crisis. Um, and so um, we started our free events. There's a couple of images you can see from there um, promoting that. And over that time, we've donated over 2,800 rooms of carpet tiles. And we work on that a room is about 15 to 20 square metres to over 4,000 households and community groups. So that's anybody who came to us with a need. And we also worked with housing associations in South Wales and into the Midlands um, to provide affordable flooring. So that was flooring that was suitable for people in whatever homes um, that looked like. So that wasn't always reuse, although that was an option, but there was also new product going in, in there as well. And in that time, supported over 1700 households through the housing associations to access that and then down in the little corner is one of those case studies that um that we've put together where we were able to supply some reused flooring alongside new flooring to public health wales um a few years ago now so yeah just a taster of that impact so that's greenstream and if anybody's got any questions more than happy to do what i can to answer them Thank you, Becky. Fantastic. All right. Well, we've had three really interesting presentations there. I'm going to pause the recording for a minute. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. So, yeah, just to say once again, if you want to click the interpretation globe icon on the bottom of your screen and click English, if you don't speak Welsh, and that way, if anyone wants to share something in Gymraeg, you are very welcome to. And we've got um, a translator who will live translate what you're saying into English. It's very exciting technology. So, um, yeah, I just want to post these links into the chat again. So just to remind you, Egin is the program that is hosting the webinar today. And that two of the people you heard speaking, Janine and Becky, are peer mentors with Egin. So if you are part of or you know a community group that you think would really benefit from their guidance and mentoring, you can have a look on our website. And even if not, egin.community, the second link is free to anyone in Wales who's working on community climate sustainability related issues. It's kind of our own social media network that we're building slowly. So there's discussion spaces and a map where you can see who's near you, get to know each other, find out what other projects are going on on there. Okay, so, uh, I'd just like to open the space to anyone who would like to either share something from your conversation that you think would be great for everyone else to hear, or if you have a burning question for one of the speakers that you didn't get to ask. 
So you can raise your hand by clicking on the reactions button, raising your hand, or you can just unmute and jump in, I think. <laughs> and if no one is going to do that, I will, yeah, great. I was going to ask the speakers to maybe share a little summary. So Katie, you put your hand up. Yeah, so we, we, we got talking in our room, or I got talking. <laughs> it's always the case. I got talking in our room um, about the challenges. So we, so Becky, we, we were talking a little bit about what you, the comment that you put in the box earlier about the fact how difficult it is to work in these spaces. And that often, you know, the values of the organisations that you're kind of working with and collaboration being so central to creating a circular economy, they're not necessarily well aligned. Um, so I remember uh, from your presentation, there was kind of like a real emphasis on creating that social circularity and the social circular economy. Um, but that often comes with, you know, trying to not trying to grow too quickly too big and and so on and not necessarily being able to scale to the the needs of say for example a large public sector or a large organization that's getting a lot of stuff flowing through so we were talking about the real need for support for businesses that want to enter into the circular economy in developing sustainable business models and i feel like that's the piece of research that we're probably not doing well at the moment we're probably not really understanding the mechanisms and how we can be really innovative about business models to ensure that wonderful things like Greenstream are sustainable in the long term. So, I mean, they lasted a long time, but they should still be here by my book. So, so we really need to, people who are working in the circular economy really need to help to focus on how we can develop those business models. Thank you, Katie. So maybe Becky, do you want to share a little bit from your room, your conversation? Yeah, absolutely. And I just like, yeah, Katie, absolutely sort of spot on and not dissimilar to the conversation we had. So, yeah, as, as um, Greenstream closed at the end of last month. Um, and I think, you know, that that trickiness that comes within working in that space is, you know, the, the conversation we had around when you've got a product that's quite niche and you've got some very clear values around what you want to do for the climate, for the environment is, is a line in that. And those sometimes move at different speeds, at different paces um, and at different scales. And what Greenstream was, was often trying to do was get into those, those public sector, those corporate markets where actually as a small organization needed more support to do that some of the time, not all of the time, you know, we had great stuff going on with some of the local authorities, housing associations, um, public health Wales. Um, and it's a huge loss and it's a really sad loss. Um, and, you know, but there's some major learnings that come out of that. And that's the sort of stuff we were talking about in our group is just, you know, what does that scale look like? How do you build those partnerships? What can, you know, what can we take from other organisations that have hubs and how can we start moving into other materials that maybe aren't quite so um, easy to understand in terms of their reuse value? Um, so we talked about, you know, maybe curtains are much easier in terms of an interior, but a flooring is not. And how, yeah, that trickiness around building that awareness and bringing other people um, on that journey. So it was a really great discussion. So Thank you to my group. Thank you. And so Janine, I'll give you the same question. What, what did you talk about in your group? Yeah, so a couple of conversations, but I think one that um, is, is a challenge was, was brought, was raised and, and is certainly a challenge for us is in terms of, um, and I will use the word tack because that's how we, we spoke about it. You know, what what do we do with the tack and also how do we guard against um, you know becoming sort of like a dumping ground for you know for, for everybody's rubbish and and that you know that that is quite a hard that is a difficult thing and you know we we sort of challenge with you know on a, on a daily basis in terms of um being challenged by by other people that you know think that then you know we should just take everything and that actually um you know they don't have to deal with their own their own waste or their own rubbish anymore because we're there so 
um, I, I spoke to the person in the group about how we um, quite clear because we're in a town centre, our shop um, kind of operates on a on a shop model um, in terms of it's presented like, a, you know, a shop. So we try and add, add that value, um, you know, but but it but it is it is, um, you know, difficult and there can be really sort of difficult conversations that, you know, some of my staff have to put up with. So that is a challenge but also you know we, we do look to try and redirect so if somebody comes with us with a for a question about something so videotapes old you know VHS is is really difficult so we do try and you know do a bit of research and see if we can direct people elsewhere or we might direct them to sort of TerraCycle or you know um sort of things but yeah it is it is diff that that's that is a tricky thing thank you so I know we've just got a couple of minutes left, but does anyone now have a question or anything else they'd like to add in there? That's okay, wonderful. <laughs> Louisa, did you unmute? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been really interesting to listen to everybody's stories. There's something that's really linking circular. I'm what Becky was just saying, and we were just talking about scale from social enterprises. And, you know, we're working with lots of groups on the ground, and there's probably potential lots of social enterprises. But I, I just feel that there's a potential circular element to procurement within, and, and these are being discussed within public and sec. At public sector organisations and how actually we should be bringing the social enterprises and that public sector to actually think about how we're challenging their procurement processes to support social enterprises so that they can be transitioned into scale and and you know and that's a, I, I believe there's a circular element in in procurement and those perhaps those are the conversations where perhaps you know should we should be start having with some of the public sector organisations so that they recognise that you know to build capacity locally with through these social enterprise actually you've got to support them fantastic yeah and katie you want to respond to that i see your hand up yeah i definitely do um i mean so the public procurement is a huge lever for the circular economy um and you know the, but there are two challenges with it so one is that and and kaz will be able to talk about this actually because that's what she's working on in the gate program but um, but the the two challenges are that firstly, procurement services are, are at the moment they've been asked to deliver absolutely everything. So they've got kind of the social value framework. They've got to deliver foundational economy. They've got to deliver circular economy, and almost the fact that we're not just saying can you deliver value that spreads across the well-being of future generations is causing all this complication about what they should be focusing on right now. Um, so that's that's part of it. But the other problem as well is that they, they are hugely <laughs> hollowed out. Whenever anything goes from public services, the first thing that usually gets the chop is someone from procurement, because there's almost this kind of assumption that procurement will be, um, you know, that they can be resilient and that everybody else understands and knows a bit about procurement. So they've got massive challenges, but it is a huge lever. Um, and being... There are some really interesting new new approaches to procurement in, in kind of the government green book that really support circular and really support working with social enterprises, much more early stage involvement, much more conversation. But it's really hard if you haven't got time to do your day job to be able to do that. So I think that's the challenge is the, the circular, you know, the circular procurement opportunities are there, but actually they are so snowed under with doing everything else and not exploiting them at the moment. Well, thank you. And I want to just say thank you again to our three wonderful speakers, Katie, Becky and Janine. And yeah, thank you everybody for joining us today. I know a lot of people have already had to go, but um, yeah, we're at half past three now. So we'll wrap up, but maybe, you know, I'll leave the room open a, another five minutes if anyone really wants to exchange contact details or, you know, say anything else. All right, so thank you.